Okay, so now we are taking out connecting rod number two. So we're going to undo. I already have them loosened and the pins are out. nuts. The other thing I've done is I've marked the cap and the rod and also the shim so we can get those on the correct side and on the, in the correct orientation when they go back together, which is incredibly important. All right, so we get that. Wiggle down the, the cap, more than likely some oil's gonna come trickling out like it is. And hopefully into our bucket. So and the shims are balanced up on top there. Right. I'll let the trickling of oil finish up there. Take the rod bolts out. You can see a little bit of the pink came through from my marking. It's actually red, but it looks pink. Push the rod up. I'll let the dripping stop and then I can move my bucket out of the way there. Push the rod up and you see how the bearing has come out of the connecting rod there. So we want to bring this down, making sure we have this side of the bearing um, orientated. We're going to, I'm going to look for a mark on here. If I don't see it, I'm going to put one on there. Since we're just replacing the rings in this engine, we're not doing a, a rebuild, so we've got to keep track of all the how everything came apart and put it together exactly the same. I don't readily see a mark, but I'm going to put it, I'm going to orientate it in my little tray here to make sure that it goes back in that same way. And we'll continue to Push the rod up. Rod, piston, and all. Up it goes. You see, at this point, I use a wooden dowel to push it up. Or a hammer handle. Sometimes works nicely. And up it is. Now I can remove it up from the top. So I'll bring the camera along. Show you what it looks like up there. Uh, before I do that, I'll show you how I have the connecting rod cap 
and hardware organized here. Put my camera around. There it is. So I have it in the orientation of how it came out of the engine. And then once I get the rod out, I'm going to put it back in that orientation. So I will now bring the camera up to the top here and show you. And there's the piston. All full of carbon and waiting to be lifted out by hand. So again, I will um, position the camera. Show you the piston from the other side. So I think it'd be a good point now to shut it off. Stop the recording. Okay, so now we have connecting rod number two on the bench, as you can see. Um, just show you a couple things about it before I put the cap back on. You can see the amount of carbon buildup we have here. It's pretty excessive. I guess um, it's being run a bit rich. Maybe a lot of idling, standing still idling. Um, and that's all stuff that needs to be cleaned off. So, and you can see my red marking on the one side, my yellow marking on the other side, and I have these parts orientated so that they can go back in the way they came out in order to maintain proper. Uh, Alignment. Just give this a little wipe and give it a look at. Get the rod back in, that rod. Let me get the other rod back in. Oh. I should do this in the image there. At its premiere, Fairbeck added the last movement of Schubert's third symphony as a kind of makeshift finale. And then we get the shim back in the place. Then the other shim. So, um, I normally, when I do my markings, I don't put them right at the center. I put them off to one side or another, which helps with the uh, getting the shim back in the position. Now we get that back in there, and that back in there, and then uh, I'm just going to put the nuts on loosely. Alright, so now there's rod number two. We're going to run it through the wash tank to get the oily residue off it. And we'll continue to get the rest of the connecting rods out. Okay, so we're now at the point where we can remove the old piston rings and get ready for the new ones. Um, as you can see, the piston rings are still in place here. This is a piston ring plier for uh, removing and installing piston rings. You can get a simple thing like this, or even like this. It's a little bit more sturdier. 
this works perfectly fine. Or you can get into something that's really maybe more complicated than needed is, is this type. But as I say, I'm fine with this. So, um, yeah, we just put that in the opening. Starting at the top, obviously. Open up the ring. And work it off. And there's the old ring, and I like to just look them over just to see if there's anything on there that uh, tells us that why we had a low compression issue. Um, and I don't see anything there. So now we move down to the next one. Same thing again. Try not to scrape the edge of the piston into the, any of the ring grooves or anything and scar them up. So now we have one more compression ring, an intermediate ring. Now we have the oil control ring. This is a three-piece type. So first we take the rail, the top rail off. Just looking for the opening, the gap. There it is. Normally uh, I can just do these with my finger. Well, there's what they call the top rail. Again, this is a three-piece type. Same with the bottom rail. And then the expander. If it comes. So I've already cleaned the carbon off at the top of this piston. Uh, number three, I actually cleaned them all off. So they're all ready. And looking in the grooves, they're looking pretty good and clean. I do have a piston ring groove cleaner. That's this guy. You fit it up like so. And then just easily, nice and easy, rotate it around in there and that'll get any carbon out that happens to be in there. Next groove. Again, these are pretty clean already. And you don't want to do it too much because you don't want to um, open up the ring laying any more than it already is. So now I want to talk a little bit about the, the pistons. As you can see it's an aluminum piston which is what Rolls-Royce used. Um, they were one of the um, um, pioneers in developing uh, a really good aluminum piston. Uh, early Silver Ghosts have an iron piston and then the later Silver Ghosts had an aluminum piston but then all Phantom Ones and everything on from that moment in time with the Silver Ghost went with the aluminum piston. <clears throat> this is an aftermarket piston and it is a T-slotted piston as you can see there and also these pistons are not the skirt is not round um, and it's also tapered and that's for expansion. So as the piston heats up, it expands out into the bore, and um, and which helps to keep it good and quiet. So since we have the T slot and the piston is not is a bit 
uh, egg shaped and tapered so the bottom of the skirt will have a, a very tight clearance uh, maybe half a thousandths I think you can go up to two thousandths and still be fine and that is to control noise um, really the only job of the skirt is to control noise and to keep the piston from rolling in the bore so you'll see some modern type pistons and they're just really nothing more than you know that on the skirt is nothing more than a, a flange coming down there just to cut back on just to stop the roll and uh, keep them quieter so now if we're looking at an original piston this is a, a, a an original piston this is a flat top piston the flat top pistons were what were, were fit fitted to the aluminum head engines the later engines and the piston comes all the way to the top and the combustion chamber is a little bit of a different design um, whereas you have the the bit of a dome on the iron head piston and the piston does not come up to the top it comes up to about there um, typically when I do an iron head engine and I'm doing new pistons I go with the flat piston that comes all the way to the top the aluminum head type piston um, I believe the extra increase in the uh, in compression is a benefit to the engine and, uh, and to its performance and all so now this is a, what they call a um, a full split skirt piston the split goes all the way down to the bottom unlike the t-slot that did not and again the clearances remain uh, fairly tight on the bottom of the skirt half a thousandths I think you can go up to two and still be okay. Um, the other thing that's different about the original pistons is these have what's called ring stops. And uh, they were supposedly to stop the ring. Well, they would stop the ring from spinning around in the bore. I guess they were concerned that the ring gaps would line up and that you would lose compression. Um, they did away with ring stops. Uh, the aftermarket pistons do not have ring stops typically and also later production replacement pistons from Rolls-Royce don't have ring stops uh, they I think that they found that the ring stops are causing more problems than doing good causing ring breakage and, and issues like that um, and you know you, you don't see ring stops typically in, in any en other engines uh, so I, I believe that they didn't feel it was all that necessary uh, this is a, an original Rolls-Royce piston with a damaged skirt. I don't know how this damage happened. I doubt it happened while it was in the engine. I've never seen uh, an original Rolls-Royce piston that had any kind of skirt issue or anything like that. Um, this is one of the only few ones I've ever seen. And this one could have happened, uh, you know, I mean this piston's been laying around the shop for I don't know how many years. Um, I don't know if it was found this way or, or what the issue was. Another neat thing about the Springfield Phantom 1 engines is that they had a full uh, uh, floating pin. Um, so the clearance of the pin in the piston and in the rod is something like half a thousandths or maybe three quarters of a thousandths. So the pin floated and then it had these aluminum caps this one's been beaten up a little bit there and the aluminum cap was designed to stop the pin from um, riding into the cylinder bore and scoring it up and they did that instead of having the um, the clips like these clips as you can see there And I just mention that because that's an interesting innovation and that was something that carried on that Rolls-Royce ended up using in some of the uh, other later British models. Phantom 3 has a pin like that with the aluminum caps and so forth and so on. Um, this piston had a groove for, for the snap ring. So at this point in time, why I'm, well, I believe I'm ready to start putting uh, new rings on so before I can do that 
I need to um, adjust the ring gap some. So I'm going to move the camera right over to my other bench here. Here are my three piece. Let's see here, I need to do a little adjustment. Three piece replacement oil control ring, the two rails, the expander. I might need to bring my camera down a little bit. So my replacement rings, I have my the sheet that came with the replacement rings. These were um, provided to me by a company called Grant Piston Ring. And they look like a nice quality ring. And they gave me the specifications for the ring gaps. They told me that the rails should be somewhere between 15 and 40 for the oil control ring. So um, these need to be adjusted. The bore of this cylinder is 25 thousandths over. I could only get rings that were 30 thousandths over. So there's a fair amount of material that needs to be um, removed. And here is the nice packaging of the compression rings. One, two, three. One being top and three being the bottom compression ring so I'm just going to go through and, and relieve a little bit on the oil control ring I like to put the oil control ring on first since it's at the bottom and you don't want to have to work um, other you don't have to work this over other rings in order to get it in position so I have this grinder here which is uh, got a nice little rest on here to help me keep the ring square and true as I remove a little bit. This wheel is a very um, soft and fine grinding wheel. Um, you, you might be able to see a little rut that somebody at my shop was probably um, using it for something. I wasn't me and they put a rut in there. So. Um, I, and I'm just using the side of the wheel, so I didn't bother to dress that out. We turn it on. And we just gently... And as you can see, I'm moving back and forth across the side of the wheel. I like to switch the sides and then I like to mate up the gaps and make sure that I'm still true. So I'll turn that off so that uh, you don't have to listen to that. And then I have a little cheater here. This is a um, very close to the same diameter of what the cylinder bore is. Maybe a few tenths off, but very close. So this helps me in the determining whether or not I'm close to the desired gap. Once I think I'm close, then I take it over to the car because the rest of the engine's still in the car. The, the cylinder blocks are still there. And then I can get up onto the, this, the side of the car and measure it out and make sure that I'm within the perimeter that's recommended. 
So again, it says 15 to 40. And I like to err on the side of a wider gap than a narrower gap. A narrower gap can cause piston ring breakage and um, that can really be developed into a serious issue which you'll be taking apart your engine again to correct. So we just take our feeler here and insert one to see how we're doing gap wise. I very comfortably got an 11 in there. Let's try maybe a 13. Thirteen went in. Let's get up to eighteen. Let's see what we can do with an eighteen. And eighteen is, is very tight. Again, it calls for a fifteen to forty. So I'm going to go more to like a twenty twenty two. So I'm going to give this another little grind here. thin rails, it doesn't take a whole lot. Let's see what we got now. Twenty went in. And a 23 is feeling rather tight. So that's what we do with, with these rails. Um, and I'll just demonstrate how it is with a compression ring. Uh, I'm sure you don't want to see a video of me sitting here grinding uh, umpteen rings. So we'll just do a demonstration on on a few so you get an idea how it works. So obviously the best thing to do first is to check it and make sure. Yep, and I can tell right off now that this is one that's gonna to need to be adjusted. So it's always good to check, even if a provider says, oh, these are already gapped, you don't need to worry about it, just put them in. I don't trust them you know they could mix up a ring um, and you could have an issue so it's always good to check all your ring gaps whenever you're um, um, replacing rings or just cleaning things or whatever the case may be so I'll try to bring the camera in closer so you can see how these grind ring around um, that keeps things equal on both sides of the gap and also helps with not heating up one side of the ring with a lot of heat from the grinder push them together and see if you're doing a nice square grind you can see I'm a little off, so I know that on these areas here, I, I need to grind a little bit more off.
wear. So I'm just going to put it in my cheater sleeve here. And as you can see, I still have a amount of material to take off. So I'll do a little more on this one just to demonstrate how it is. And you want to go back and forth on the wheel so you don't develop a rut. And also, going back and forth like that helps to get a nice square edge. Mating up nicely. Pack it into the cheater sleeve. We're getting closer. Getting a little closer there. As you can see, it's a you know a bit of a long process. So I'm almost at a point where I have a gap. Not quite there yet. surface plate here so I can I'm getting start to get close I can push the ring all the way to the bottom and then I know it's square which is important for measure, getting good ring gap measurement and so maybe you can see see I am a little off so I need to square up the opening some but let's get a feeler in there and just to get an idea I think it's under 10 still. Yep. So we're going to do a little more.
starting to square up nicely. Try my nine again. Okay, so I'm getting a nine in now. See if we can get a 14. Pretty big jump. 14 starts to go in, but it's tight. So we might be near like a 12 or a 13. So what I'll do is I'll take my ring and my feeler over to the car now. This guy in here. Then I have my other piston for lining it up in the board. Let me get that. I normally take an old piston, or I don't know how much of an old piston this really is, and um, square the ring up that way. It's important that it's square. Take my feeler. And it's coming up as a tight 22. So let's see where it comes in at. I got a 20 here now. Twenty's tight. Let's try an 18. And 18 is a little tight, so I'm going to relieve a little bit on that. But um, what I'm going to do is bring the camera up. So you can kind of see it in there. two pistons that are in there with their new rings. I have a little oil on top seeping down to lubricate things. And also I have done some um, some honing to these these bores. If you've seen a previous video you'll see that there is an awful lot of carbon and build up and all um, which has been all cleaned off. So I don't have this piston all the way to the top, but you'll see a little bit of a line right in there. And um, that's about as far top to the top the piston goes. I normally try to get the ring up towards the top of that so that you're measuring on the smallest part of the bore. Because there might be, I mean there is only a few tenths difference between the very top and, and going down a little bit. If you have an engine that has an awful lot of wear, you may have a ridge that has developed at the top of the sleeve or of the bore, um, which needs to be removed. Typically an engine that has that much wear is not a candidate for doing new rings, but a candidate for uh, rebuilding completely. A new bore uh, or uh, boring out the bores with new pistons and 
and, um, and, and doing it that way would be a proper way to handle it. So um, these honed up nicely. This engine again, the reason why this is a good candidate for new rings is because it had some cylinders that were very low on compression at zero and um, but the engine had been rebuilt not that long ago by a prominent rebuilder. Um, it's been, well, it was a while ago, but not that many miles ago, I should say. So, um, again, this is a good candidate. And my concern was that maybe there were some broken rings. And that they, um, so we, I felt that it was best to go into this engine and um, check those over. And since the rings aren't broken, but they didn't have any compression, we're going to put new ones in and hopefully we'll go on and get really good compression now. So hopefully that gives you a good lay of the land of setting ring gaps. Um, one other thing I'm going to cover here is putting the rings onto the pistons which really isn't a very difficult or complicated thing but I'll just go over that process so that um, you have a better idea how that works. Okay so now we have our piston ring gaps set and we can put those onto the pistons. You first start with your expander on the on the three piece type. If it's just a single piece ring, then um, you just put that on by itself. I was taught to use a stone, and if there's any burr, to smooth it down and just sort of rub your finger along there and make sure that it's good and smooth. And you'll see on these. There's a red and a green uh, coloring on there, and that's just so that um, you prevent it from overlapping. So as it says in the instructions, put the red and green sections so that they're not overlapping. Again, here's the instructions. They're not overlapping and uh, that that's aligned with the pin. and we're, we have the skirt, the split in the skirt facing towards us. So now we take our bottom rail, again, we use our stone, make sure there's no burr that has been left from when we were grinding the openings there. We rub our fingers along there, make sure that everything feels good. And these can be a little bit of a nuisance to put on. Again, we look at our it says that the bottom gap should be over towards the right there. So that's what we're going to do. And with these thin ones, a lot of times we don't need the um, the ring plier tool. So we just work it in and sometimes they can be a nuisance getting them set in there and the expander in position and all. And you might have to take it on and off a couple times. And just be very careful with it and gentle because it can break and you don't want that. to be put in position.
All right, so now we got that in there. And then again, like I say, you want the, I'll turn it here and so you can see the red and the green. And then over so many degrees is that opening for the rail. So we make sure that's all in there and seems happy. Nothing's flipped around or over or whatever. That's good. Then we take our other top rail. Again, we use our stone. Um, usually you know you did enough with the stone when you get a little shiny area there, a little silver area, because there was a some sort of a black finish over this. And it doesn't take much more than a couple little rubs like that. And again, just sort of feel around all around there, make sure there's no burr sticking up. Now we put this guy in. There it goes. Make sure it all seems happy in its little slot there. All seems good. And the red and green is still how it's supposed to be. Now we just go with the number three ring. I have that over here. It's already been gapped. But I still need the Burrs. And a silly little burr can ruin your day. Um, it'll really make the ring stuck in its groove and cause a real issue. So now with these. I do recommend using the ring pliers and also take note you read when you read your instructions you may see a marking to indicate top or bottom um, these are very nicely written on their top hopefully you can see that sometimes it's a dot or whatever the case may be it's usually in your instructions if there is such a indication um, sometimes it's just the inner shape of the ring and how they want it so we use our ring plier, expand it out, drop it in and then kind of rotate it around and make sure it's happy in this little new home here. It's not getting stuck or anything. Now we move on to ring number two. Another one that has top on it. Let me put the uh, number two ring in.
got it a little stuck in both grooves, so I need a little screwdriver to help me here. Again, be very careful with these. These are iron, so they are somewhat brittle and they can very easily break. You want an iron ring that to ride on an iron bore. It is generally what I was always told. We're doing the top ring now. And I'd forgot to mention in the gapping that if you're going if it's good to have the top rings a little bit wider than the other rings um, since they are exposed to the most heat and also the most variation when they're riding up and down in the bore since they're riding in in the other wear areas up from the other rings there's going to be little steps that it's going to have to go up and down Again, we note it's top. Okay, they're all in there and they all feel good. Really good, I'm happy. And we're going to be ready for our spring compressor. Um, there's quite a few different designs in spring compressor. And I use them all. <laughs> I use the one that works the best with the application. This is a snap-on type. has different bands. And it works usually fairly well. This is the one I use the most. Then you also have... this type a band type these have been around for quite a while um, you put a key a square key in there tighten it up to squeeze your rings in and then the other type is a um, is a tapered type I think I have one of those around Well, I guess I don't have that one around handy at the moment, so um, I'll have to put an inset of a picture of one. And that one works fairly well also. It's a little quicker sometimes to use those. But hey, we're not in a hurry. So, so now um, what I like to do is to get some uh, oil in around the rings and a little bit on the skirt to help it so it'll slide into the bore a little easier and it's also just easier on it in general we'll take her out of the vise Slather it up with some oil. Uh, this is just motor oil. The uh, oil you're going to use in the engine when you're running it. I'm going to go ahead and put it back in the vise again. And then we're going to position our ring gaps how is recommended in the instructions. So it says here they like to have them a third apart from each other. So we put that one there. 
That one there. And this one. Over here. And again, keep our red and green above the pin. All right. So now we put our ring compressor on. Let me open it up. Slip it over. If you're using a piston that has ring stops, make sure that the opening of the ring is in, is where the stop is, because when you go to clamp down with your compressor, if it's not, then you're gonna snap the ring. So we just snug it up on there. You don't want it overly tight. And there you go. Oh, also, this is the split of the uh, piston, and this is on the non-thrust side of the engine. On this particular engine, Springfield Phantom 1 Ironhead, that is on the driver's side. And so, I positioned the clamping part of it in alignment with this uh, split, because that's where... Oh, you have room with working with the studs. So you just make sure that's all on there nicely. And before I put the piston back in, I want to measure the big end just to know that we're on uh, on a good page um, with the clearance of the big end. Um, I had already measured the piston and the bore relationship and found that we're good there. Um, I was using a big micrometer which you just and the measuring place is right down in here. You just measure there. That's the largest portion of the of the piston. And when we read the micrometer, we come up with four inch two seventy. Wait a minute. Um, 75 because that is the um, that is the uh, the oversize these are um, um, four inch and a quarter standard plus 25 thousandths so we go to 475 so and, and that's what we have there all right So we'll put this back down so nothing falls and gets hurt. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my um, I'm going to take my smaller micrometer, go over to the car, go underneath and measure the crank pin on the uh, on the engine at, for the number three, and uh, I'll go and get that measurement. And, uh, and I'll be right back. I'll only take a moment.
All right, so I have my measurement of my crank pin here, my micrometer. And I place it in my micrometer stand. And for this, I'm gonna to have to reposition the camera. Take my piston out of the out of the vise here. So the rings are safe now because they're in that being held by the compressor. All right, so let's move the camera around so you can get a better look. You can see my micrometer there. And then I like to use dial bore gauges like this. Uh, these read to the tenth. They're really super accurate and nice to use. Um, whenever you're doing measuring with a micrometer and a dial bore gauge, there's a lot of sense of feel that you have to develop, and it takes a little bit of time and a lot of practice. Um, it's consistency that matters. Um, so you want to make sure that every time you measure the same thing, the same distance, that you come up with the same measurement. You might be off a tenth here and there, um, which is acceptable because, I mean, that could be just from temperature or whatever else. And normally a tenth isn't going to make a huge difference in what we're doing. So we take our dial bore gauge and we zero it out to match it up to the micrometer. And it looks like it's the same, that this crank pin is the same as the other one that I had measured, because this is number three. So I have that zeroed. And then you take your gauge and you put it in your big end. I have this torqued. Measure that area out. And I'm coming up to two and a half. Um, two to two and a half is what is acceptable. Um, the other ones came right out at two. Oh, okay, so it's getting a little closer to two in that area, so that's good. So, let's maybe get a better view over this way. So, yeah, so there's the big end. Maybe a difficult angle for the, you to see. So I can spin it around there. So we're good there. All right, so the next step will be um, in getting this piston down into the bore. So I will get that all set up and we'll do that next. Okay, so now we're ready to put our piston and connecting rod in. So again, the split goes on the side that is not the thrust side. The solid side goes on the thrust side. Um, you will also see numbers on the connecting rod, they go on the uh, the thrust side as well. 
Um, on, in this case, it's the uh, camshaft side. Numbers typically face the cam side, a side of the engine. So, and then we slip this down into the bore. I already put a good coating of oil on the inside of the bore, and I have a good coating of oil on the outside of the uh, piston and around the rings as well. The uh, throw uh, that, or that crank pin happens to be at the very bottom, which is the, uh, the best position for it to be right now. So we get this down into the bore. We make sure everything feels nice and uh, slides in to that part. And we take our mallet and uh, we tap her down in. Normally I like to get to just where the ring is starting to go in and then give it a little bit more of a push. And down they go and then uh, ring compressor is free, so we'll get that out of the way. And we continue to tap the piston down a little more. here. Still coming down. few more inches to go. If you feel anything at this point gets solid or hard or doesn't feel like it's cooperating then you gotta check it out. Okay, so now I have it down far enough to where I can get the bearing assembly in place. So I'll see if I can get a, this is the bird eye view, we'll see if we can get the worm eye view now. Reposition the camera. So please bear with me. set the tripod down here okay so now we will see that there's all the bearing and the tools and such we're going to need I'll lower this guy down so this might be a tricky thing so Bear with me. Okay. Move the pieces over here. So, we 
let you guys see what's going on here. So this is the throw um, right here. So it looks like I gotta position the camera a little better. Okay, this throw here, yep. All right, here's the rod hanging there. I have red marked on the split side. And um, it looks like I could come down a little bit more. So I might need to give it a another tap from up top. <clears throat> so let me go and do that. I shall return. All right, so we're down a little further. We can now get the uh, one shell in place. We're gonna apply a little bit of a assembly lube. Okay, so I had a little battery shutdown issue in the middle of things, so now we're, we're back onto it. So back to my assembly lube. You just put a little smear it out on there. And that'll just help things um, for a while we're cranking to do that initial startup uh, to make sure that there's some lubrication there. As you can see, I have a marking. So the red I have to line up with what's red on the connecting rod, and that happens to be on the split side. So we put this shell up in there. Sometimes it takes a little bit of effort to get the rod down and in place with the new rings and all dragging onto the boards. Shouldn't be a whole lot of effort though. Sometimes what works is to give the engine a little bit of a turn to meet up with the connecting rod. I think what I'm going to do is tap down the piston from the top. 
because <clears throat> I can't quite get my hand to do that. We're all good to do. Down there. I'm going to line those up. Put our bolts in. Bolt with the red dot on the red side. Bolt with the yellow on the yellow side. At this stage, I normally put my assembly lube on the bottom shell because sometimes the shims like to drop down. So we'll get that there. And remember when we were taking these apart, we marked everything. So we got our, our pink there. So we line up our pink all along there. It is very critically important that the shells and the shims go in exactly how they came out. Um, if you flip them around, over, upside down, or whatever, it can be a real problem, a real issue that you do not want to have to experience. So the shim is happily staying up there. So we get the next shim up in place. Wants to creep down a little bit, so we'll take our bearing cap, put it up in there, make sure it all seats in home nicely. Put the rod nut bolt nut on there, and then the other one. The other side. Then we just make sure everything looks happy and in place and nothing's doing anything that it shouldn't. And I thought I had my torque wrench down here, but it. I don't see it, so I gotta go get my torque wrench. So, have my torque wrench set. Just take up a little bit on each one at a time to keep everything nice and even. Right now I have my torque wrench set at, what is it, 25. And that's just to get things in position. Um, once I get all the rods in, I will do a final torque 
and then I have to pin all of these nuts but for now um, that gets it in there and then I can give the engine a rotation and make sure that uh, everything is um, moving around properly which I will do now engines that don't have a starter ring gear are a little harder to turn. There it goes. Oops. It's just harder to get a purchase on something. And there it goes. And the scraping you hear is the uh, piece of linkage against the fan. And I like to give it a few rotations around, make sure everything, there isn't any locking up or any unevenness, that it's nice and free. So I'll bring it down to the bottom again. anyway for the next rod and then that'll enable me to look down into the bore to make sure there's no scratches or anything going on in there that I don't like so everything went well with getting that rod in we have three more to go so the whole process that I had just done in this video it needs to be repeated three more times with the rings and measuring and uh, and getting it all together and then once we get all that done we can work on getting the cylinder head on and the valves need to go in and the cylinder head on and this oil pan and we'll have her running and out on the road <laughs>